everybody. Welcome to our NASCAR throwback special. Over the next two hours, we are reliving the 2004 Daytona 500, where Dale Earnhardt Jr. claimed the first of his two wins in the Great American Race. It is the ultimate NASCAR watch party, as we have current and former drivers, crew chiefs, team members, our NASCAR on NBC crew, and also you, the fans, joining in, too. We're going to have everything social appearing on the bottom of your screen during the race so that you can see what everybody is thinking and feeling during our look back. And we all get to watch it in real time right along with Dale Jr. himself, who in fact tweeted this just a short time ago. Can't wait to watch this tonight. We look forward to his tweets over the next couple of hours, and we look forward to yours as well. You just use the hashtag NASCAR throwback to make your voice heard. We'll be looking for it, and we'll also be joined by our Hall of Famer, Dale Jarrett, who drove in the race, as well as our Parker Kligerman. And another one of our colleagues, Greg Biffle, won the poll for this race, but started at the rear due to an engine change, and that pushed Dale Jr. to the number one spot on the grid. Here were Jr.'s thoughts going into the race. Now, your dad took 20 years to win the Great American Race. You're in your fifth. Can you imagine what it would mean to you to win this? Because you know how much it meant to him. Well, yeah, I mean, it was awesome, you know, when he won. And uh, after everything he'd been through, he's come so close so many times. You, I've seen this race lost on the last lap so many times, more than I've seen it won on the last lap. So uh, it just... Uh, Hopefully we're in the right place at the right time. And if I win this race, uh, I don't know if the car will ever stop. Some foreshadowing there. And before we get going, we also have a poll up on our NASCAR on NBC Facebook page. The question, what was the greatest moment of Dale Jr.'s career? Your choices are his 2001 win in the July Daytona race, the 2004 Daytona 500, or the 2014 Daytona 500. So weigh in on Facebook. We're going to update the results throughout the evening as well. So let's get this throwback going and head to Daytona International Speedway for the start of the 2004 Daytona 500. The sun has come out, it's a breezy afternoon, and for 43 of the greatest drivers in the world, in front of 200,000 fans, their afternoon begins by shaking hands with the President of the United States, who arrived just a few moments ago, with Dale Earnhardt Jr., Elliot Sadler, and the rest of the starting field. 16 million dollars in awards on the line, better than a million dollars to the winner. And the drivers all looking toward the starter stand. The honorary starter for the 500, Whoopi Goldberg, has the green flag in hand. In a minute, she's going to set 200,000 voices yelling in the air as these 43 drivers set off on their once-a-year chance to win their sport's biggest prize, the Daytona 500. Pace car is off. Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Elliott Sadler bring the field down for the start. The 46th Daytona 500 is green. Okay, now don't forget, it takes about a lap and a half, two laps to get these cars fully up to speed. And Elliott Sadler on the outside in the 38 car would love to beat Junior, get in front of that eight car because they're concerned if the eight car gets in front, he's so fast, a lot of cars will not be able to pass him. Now this track, don't forget, we've had a lot of rain here, so the track is green. There's not a lot of rubber, so we're gonna these guys are gonna have to really feel the track out to see where these cars work the best. You have to say the bush race, the high side was really good for some guys. So there's a little bit of feeling around right now to see how your car's gonna react and where it's gonna react the best. First few laps, always very tense. The traffic close together. One driver makes a mistake. It can cause a big problem for a number. Earnhardt Jr. leads lap one by about a foot. Tony Stewart is behind him in the 20, pushing. The outside lane, it's Elliott Sadler in 38, pushed by Sterling Marlin in 40. And you've got to be careful right now. You do not want to be put in the middle. That's why these cars are running really close. You've got to watch in your mirror. You've got to put a block on, because if you get put in the middle, you're probably going to go backwards. But somebody's going to try the middle. They're going to feel like, well, maybe I can use the middle to go forward. Tony Stewart moved up to try to see what would happen if he got out behind the eight car. Look how the eight car shot away from him when those two cars, the 38 and 20, got side by side. That's a free wide back there. Inside lane starting to advance a bit. Stewart clears Elliott Sadler for second place. Now it's Jamie McMurray in the 42 up to the inside of Sadler for third. 
and he's followed by Michael Walter in the 15 car, the winner of last year's Daytona 500. The good thing about Sadler, he's got a really good drafting partner right now. Sterling Marlin knows how to draft as well as anybody on this racetrack, so if he can keep Sterling there, he may just push him right back to the front. It is first to 40, two and a half seconds, covers the entire field. And look at that, 194 miles per hour. Larry Fort was running. On board, Kevin Harvick. Running in 10. And right now is the best these cars are going to feel because the tires will start wearing and these cars will start sliding more and more every lap. McMurray clearing that outside lane of Elliott Sadler. Michael Waltrip pushes through. Now the first four are cleared. This is a camera we have inside the helmet of Michael Waltrip. You see the visor crack just a little bit to keep from fogging up. And this really gives you an idea of what the driver goes to and how violent that these cars are on this Daytona racetrack. Checking the mirror to his left, now looking ahead to the corner ahead of him. And Michael Walker running in fourth position. Just doesn't look like that outline. That sideline's got it, Benny. Not right now, does it? But it might be because the eight car is just simply so fast. Yeah. Jimmy Johnson in 48, racing Elliott Sadler now. That'll be for fifth place. Dale Earnhardt Jr. kind of got a gift for that pole position when uh, Greg Bibble's team had to change the engine. Bill, he's making the most of it right now. That's how good he is, Alan. He got the pole while it was in a different race. How about that? Yeah. Led the field to the green flag. Same car that they ran at the sport restrictor plate races last year. Was a little tight in the twin 125s. Junior wasn't really pleased with it yesterday. They worked on it to try and make him happy today. Dave? Bill, we showed Tony Stewart's pre uh, last happy hour final practice crash yesterday in the pre-race show today. Tony's team worked on that car a lot yesterday afternoon. I talked with crew chief Greg Zipidelli this morning. I said, well, did you get it to a field dressing state or is it better than that? And he kind of laughed and said, it's better than that. It's not as perfect as we want it. Marty? Dave, Michael Walter told us on countdown to green and reiterated to me before he got in the car, I will work with the eight car. We will work together. Our number one goal at DEI this year, work together, together better than we ever have. It starts today, but on the last lap, it's every man for himself. Michael Waltrip has won the Daytona 500 in two of the last three years. He's running in fourth now. Starting to climb that hill back there. Is that Matt Kenseth? Matt Kenseth, the 17 car, the 2003 Cup champion, has moved to the top of the racetrack, and he's finding some good grip up there. Actually, Ben, he's been up there really since lap one, so he was the first guy that went way up on that bank. I'm not sure he's going up there because he likes it up there because maybe his car is tight and it won't turn. Marty, what are they saying about the 17 car? He's been up in that top groove, Wally, since Thursday. They really haven't run the bottom groove that much, but Matt likes to run up there, especially in the early run. Wally, you can talk about this. He wants to save that right front tire. If you try to keep the car on the bottom and force it down to be on the bottom, it'll wear out that right front quicker. You're right. It's easier on the right front tire if you're up high. These guys down on the bottom are tugging on the steering wheel. Oh, we got oh, some smart guys at six car. Trouble turn number three. And the caution flag is out. Oh, hang on there, Mark. I don't think Mark could see anything there for a while. He's uh -oh. oh, Johnny Benson still can't see it, I don't think, out of that car. Robbie Gordon bouncing off each other. That car was just completely filled with smoke. Mark did a great job there. Trying to keep it as straight as possible. Mark Martin's 20th try. I couldn't see nothing. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't see. Oh, you did find it, great, bud. And how disappointing is that? Watch a car up there on the high bank. You'll see a little bit of smoke here for a second, and then, boy, it just pours out. Watch everybody dive underneath. And he can't see anything. Wow. And I tell you what, looks like he took, he made the 99 and 17, might have made some contact. Teammates of Mark Martin. Yeah. Kevin Harvick, I'll bet he's got a windshield full of liquid right now. So he'll be having to make a pit stop, probably. Leaders come by the opening of pit road. First one is Kevin Harvick. He's going to jump in there. And get his windshield clean. Yeah, right. From 10th spot. Followed by some of the other cars farther back. You see Matt Kenseth and the 17 is in. After the contact he had, getting squeezed in that uh, little, little shuffle up. Dave? And 
And of course, Kevin Harvick needing to come in and take care of that windshield. No report on exactly how bad it was, but, if, but it was going to be obviously covered. They'll work on him, get it cleaned off, and get him back out, change four tires at the same time. Bill? Rusty Wallace still looking for his first win in the Daytona 500. This will be a four tire stop in fuel and the first test of how good four new tires are going to go up against old ones. Rusty stalled and he's on his way. Ah, you can't do that at Daytona. Oh, uh -oh. tire loose. That's going to cost somebody. Whoa, no, who's that? Derek Cope ran right over the cone. And that's a new tire somebody was trying to put on the car. You can tell by the sticker that's still on it as it rolls around there. So, caution early in the Daytona 500 after Mark Martin's 20th try to win the race literally went up in smoke. It wasn't a pretty sight for Kevin Harvick, who was running behind Mark Martin when the thing let go. Wow. You're watching NASCAR on NBC. If you notice on the racetrack, Tony Stewart is in front of Dale Earnhardt Jr. This is when they were coming to pit road for the green flag stops back at lap 29. And watch how Stewart got the lead. Yeah, Stewart just got into the pit lane faster than Dale Jr. And like I said earlier, very hard to judge to slow your car down enough. You're really on the brakes, you're downshifting. And like BP said, you got to be at 55 right there. Beginning right there to the next line, you got to be at 55 miles per hour. Junior not taking any chances. He knows he has a great race car. So now Tony Stewart in front of Dale Jr. And Stewart is the race leader. There are a handful of cars in front of him on the racetrack in that outside lane, though. Those are all people on the tail end of the lead lap. The pace car came out, picked up the leader. Those cars were all a lap down at the time. The leaders peeled off the pit. These cars didn't. The leaders came off pit road behind them. They basically got two and a half miles to make up on Tony Stewart. They are tail end of the lead lap. This is when things get a little bit sticky. Kind of dicey. Little dicey. There's your leader, Tony Stewart, with the bubble over him. You got the leader coming, and you got these guys that really need a yellow, and they're going to do a lot of blocking to try to keep Tony Stewart back so they don't get put a lap down. Got Elliot Sadler there in uh, 38, Mike Skinner in 33, Johnny Sauter in 30, Ricky Craven in 32, Ricky Rudd in 21, and Bobby Labonte in 18. Those are all tail end of the lead lap, two and a half miles behind the leader, Tony Stewart. This is where you got to have patience, Benny. This is where guys lose their patience. Speaking of patience, how about three wide for the leader? And the 14 car was slow on that restart. Larry Foyt. Junior said, well, should I follow Tony? Uh, okay, I guess I'll go up there three wide. Don't want to be in the middle. 48 car, Jimmy Johnson to the inside. He's racing for that lead as well. Lead car is all sandwiched up in the lap traffic now. These guys right in front of Tony Stewart and Dale Jr., they're really using the mirror, Benny. Because you've got to block the move if you can. You don't want to get past and put a lap down. Spencer caught in the center in the seven car. When you, when you get a lap down, it just says, I can't win. You've got to get that lap back. Got to be on the lead. As long as you're on the lead lap, you've always got a shot. Ricky Rudd goes a lap down. So you got Jimmy Johnson in the 48 in the inside lane, Tony Stewart in the 20 in the outside lane. They're racing for the lead in and among all of these cars trying to stay on the lead lap. And that's probably the spot Casey Mears in that 41 <laughs> just does not <laughs> want to be in. On board Jimmy Johnson. Stewart's car off the back bumper. Larry Floyd's car has made it around to the pit lane. We do stay under the green flag. Oh, look at the 97 car. Kurt Busch just drives down under Tony Stewart. What a move. So Jimmy Johnson takes the lead. Kurt just can't follow him through and get up there in front of Stewart. Well, he tried so hard. Oh, that's close. Contact there. Earnhardt Jr. and Stewart. Yeah, and Earnhardt Jr. is what, this, what we call bump draft, and you kind of bump the guy ahead of you. You only want to do that in the straightaway, but it helps shove the car in front of you. It gives you a little bit more speed. It's 
So Jimmy Johnson chose the lane that moved in that big traffic jam. He jumped down to that inside lane and has gotten in front of Stewart for the lead, but maybe not for long. Yes, Stewart got a big, big run getting off the back straightaway in the turn three. Here goes Junior in the middle. Is he going to make it three wide? Casey Kane is Ooh, slow on the easy. back stretch. 20 car, wow, that's a handful. You saw Casey Kane, right over Ham's nine car, off the pace. And that looked a little sideways, but you know what, folks? That's big sideways when you run 190 mile per hour. Matt, what, what, what happened with the nine car? Tommy Baldwin just asked Casey, is it running or is it coasting? He says it is coasting. They told him to try the backup ignition box to see if that might help the race car fire. Casey just said it's something big. Yeah, it's it big. It is broken. It is smoking. It's big, Matt. He's got big smoke coming out of the pipes. Dale Earnhardt Jr. just pushing Tony Stewart down that back stretch. Jimmy Johnson in the 48 tried him on another charge in that inside lane. But Tony Stewart pulls up behind the rookie. Oh, 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 oh. He said, rookie, <laughs> look in the mirror. <laughs> oh, man. Yikes. Johnny Sauter in that 30 car. The Cedar Wisconsin native driving for Richard Childress Racing. And now we're on board Tony. Man, look at the run he's got on the straightaway. Boom! He'll hit the car of Ricky Craven. That's the bump draft. Helps push Ricky. But like I said, you got to be real careful. You don't want to do that too late getting into the corner either because it gets you sideways when you get in the corner. You really need to be careful to be straight when you do that. When Sauter jumped out, he wasn't exactly straight. He almost got turned sideways. You know, think about doing that. Oh, got a smoker. Another one in the middle of the pack. It's like a right Roush car. Push. Another Roush car, BP. Oh, oh man. man. That looks like a right front fender to me. Could be. Could be. Maybe get some. Pull it down some. Maybe he had some contact with somebody. Did he just say cool it down some? Is that what he said? It's got like a, got like a kink in it. Right there at the it's back. It's got some contact. Up and the tire. Yeah, the right front fender is rubbing the tire. That's the smoke. He's going to have to go to pit road to get that fender knocked out off that tire. He was running fourth. Now, well, who's the other guy? Yeah, who's he got hit? that kind of damage? Somebody else has got some damage somewhere. Well, let's find out. Who did the 97 hit? Watch okay, there, Junior's car. There you see down on the bottom, he gets right into the left rear, left rear tire of Dale Junior. Now, if it just hit the tire, Junior probably be okay. Well, Dale Earnhardt Jr. on the track and all that traffic. No comment on his radio after the contact with the 97. And part of the reason for that is he couldn't get a word in. His spotter, Stevie Reeves, on the radio the whole time, walking Earnhardt through traffic a lap ago. That's because of practice earlier this week. Earnhardt stole. He's never seen anybody that aggressive in practice or the race. So it's Johnson, Earnhardt Jr., Stewart, the top three. Your guess from there on back, they're all right there in a big pack. You're watching NASCAR on NBC. Welcome back to this interactive NASCAR throwback special. Here is a behind-the-scenes look at our control room in Stanford, Connecticut. This is where the real magic happens. Our social media team working very hard to monitor your tweets. Remember, use the hashtag NASCAR throwback so we can use your post during the show. I think I saw a couple pizza boxes in there as well, but we do need to feed them. They need energy. Let's bring in Dale Jarrett and Parker Kligerman now. DJ, you have three 500 wins to your credit. You finished 10th in this race. Uh, let's pull up some of the tweets that we've been seeing so far and take a look this one from the nascar on nbc page it says what did you look like in 2004 here's what dale jared and parker Kligerman looked like hashtag nascar throwback parker how old were you <laughs> at this time and do you remember watching this I race <laughs> I would have been 13. I do remember watching the race, but what I can tell from that photo is I'm very young because I have no sponsors. So you de you definitely had a couple more sponsors than me at that time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I was much older than 13. We just leave it at that. You also just a had, little bit. You yes. also had the Justin Bieber haircut thing happening as well, but that's for another time. That as well. DJ's, I'm going to bring it back. DJ, some of the fans that have been tweeting so far using the hashtag have shown a lot of love for fellow Hall of Famer, the late Benny Parsons, uh, hearing him once again. 
Yeah, what a great voice he had and, and knowledge of the sport. Not only was he a tremendous competitor on the racetrack, but he did so great in the booth. I mean, it was just like you were there. And he had such a good sense of keeping up with the race, everything that was going on, and sometimes seeing things that the cameras didn't even catch. All right, well, we're glad that you both are with us. Let's get back to the race, though. Pick things up on lap 54. New leader as we come back to the Daytona 500. Dale Earnhardt Jr. has just stuck the nose of the Budweiser Chevy underneath Jimmy Johnson's 48 car. Hold on, there goes Jimmy <laughs> back by. I think. Yeah, it's a pretty good contest right now. Kurt Busch, 97 car, off pit road, two nearly three laps down to the leaders. After repairs to the right front corner of his car, we showed you the hit with Earnhardt Jr. earlier. I think Stewart wanted to stay up in that high line, probably to help his teammate, the 18 car, Bobby Labonte, to try to stay close to that front to get his lap back, but... Decided to go low. Was well, the choice of 8 or 18? Uh, I think I'll take the 8. My teammate's just going to have to go on his own. He's going to have to tuck it out, right? Bill, where are deals being made down there? Uh, well, they're talking about oh, Junior moving to the inside all over the track. 20 team and the 18, they've been running together. Junior moves to the outside. But what they want to do, Benny, is they want to make sure they're going to pit on the same lap. Last time, the 8 car was going to pit on lap 31, but when they found out the 20 was going to come a lap earlier, they came that time. They had told Junior to take 30 on the track, come in on 31. They said, no, 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 pit this time. They want to stay with the 20. Here comes Bobby Labonte on the outside, Benny. Uh -huh. He wants to get on that lead lap. 18 car, the first one lap down, and he's in 30th place. See if the 18 gets in front of the 20. 20 decides to follow the 18 if it all sorts out. Bobby Labonte not on the lead lap. Matt Kenseth right behind Labonte, and the 17 is. That is the fourth place car. And Kurt Busch has moved up to the outside, hoping that Junior would go with him, but he goes by Elliott Sadler anyway. Remember, though, BP, that 97 has fresher tires than all these other cars he's racing with. That unscheduled pit stop is going to go. How about Jimmy Johnson, Matt? Jimmy says the car is just a tick on the tight side. Jimmy has never won a restrictor plate race. Chad Canales is going to victory lane here in the 500 as a crew member of Jeff Gordon's team. Last night while doing media in victory lane, when it was all said and done, Chad walked up on the winner's podium, stood there, and then wrote CK. He wanted to mark his spot, reserve it for later today. They feel like they've got a great car that can go to victory lane. Now it's just up to Jimmy. Marty? Well, Mike, you see Matt Kenseth up in the front there, and uh, you would never for, you would ever, never realize that they had some damage early on. They have tailpipe damage, which Robbie Reiser, the crew chief, believes is hurting the horsepower. They also have some body damage, hurting the aerodynamics, but Matt keeping the car up front. Bill, and an outstanding run so far for Greg Biffle, won the pole here a week ago today, had to start at the rear of the field because an engine change. This morning, he said he was confident, but somewhat concerned with that new engine, but he's had a good run and done a good job getting it to the front. Burns. And Weber, we're keeping our eye on these sets of tires that come off the cars. Kevin Harvick stayed out as long as anyone on that first run and pitted as the leader. I checked out all his tires, checked with the crew. Everything looks very good. Even that right front, the most sensitive of the tires. Matt? Dave, the Gordon Vickers combination made it up to fifth and sixth. Then Jeff said, my car is just a little more on the free side. Please ask Brian to give me a little bit of slack back there. He gave a little too much. Lost position. He's dropped back to nine. Tell you what, Jeff Gordon's been coming up through that pack. You know, I'm thinking, watching him, he and Kevin Harvick, Wally and Benny, we're seeing a different kind of Daytona 500 than we have the last few years, and it's because of these new tires that NASCAR asked Goodyear to develop. If you're not familiar with the story, the tires in past years have been so durable and so good that you didn't need tires. You could basically run a set all day long, and they wouldn't lose any speed. And it became where the first guy off pit road was going to be the guy that won the race. Drivers wanted that changed by NASCAR so that a car's handling and a driver's skill were once again more of a factor in deciding a race. Goodyear did that, and we're seeing the cars that handle better, like Harvick and Tony Stewart and these guys, able to drop back in the pack and then come back up and do a lot of passing. I think the fans wanted it more than the drivers. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I agree. I'm probably right. But you know, these guys, that, the, the teams that can adapt to change is the best. They're still going to be the best teams. They're going to have the cars. They're going to be the fastest. But I think once saw uh oh, oh, trouble. Back straight away. Rusty Wallace, Jeff Green, and more. Any wave them off behind. 
That's Ken Schrader. Kenny Schrader. Oh, darn it. Schrader and Rusty in the 43 car. Man, there's Jeff Green. So Rusty will not win the Daytona 500 in 2004. Rusty Wallace in his 22nd Daytona 500 try. He has scored 54 wins at NASCAR's top level. But this race, its biggest, has not been one of them. Well, Kurt Busch is going to get one of his laps back. Elliott Sadler will come back around, be on the tail end of all those lead lap cars. Labonte be the lucky dog? Yeah, Bobby Labonte hung on with Tony, became the lucky dog. Well, let's see what happened here. Okay, the Rusty middle. Wallace just got squeezed in. The 42 car, Jamie McMurray, came up the racetrack right across the left front of uh, Rusty Wallace, turned Rusty into the 43 car of uh, Jeff Green and collected Trader. Ooh, see Johnny Benson there come whistling by in the grass. That had to be a hairy ride. That's one of those deals where, you know, most of the time, two out of three of the other cars are just at the wrong place at the wrong time. There's nowhere they could have gone. See, McMurray just had no idea that Rusty was moving up on his outside. And Rusty had to avoid the 42 car. And now watch these guys to the right here as Jeff Green spins come whistling through the grass. Yeah, running through the grass 180 is always exciting. Oh, there's yes. John Andretti just barely getting by. Here they come down pit road. Marty. First stall on pit road for Matt Kenseth, BP. He said it's about as loose as I can stand it at the beginning of the run, but the track is getting slick. Leave it like it is. Four tires, no changes, Dave. Cody Stewart said, I'm loose at times, I'm tight at times. I'm having fun driving this thing. Don't change anything except change the tires and fill it full of fuel. Bill? Yes, minimal damage on the eight car from that contact with the 97. A little tight half around out. Wait down the left rear. Junior's on his way to you, Matt. Jimmy Johnson's car was tight. He's not going to beat the 20 off or the eight. They went one round in the left Great stop by Matt Kenseth's team. Looks like they're going to pick him up two spots on pit road and get him out second. So what else is new? Kenseth's crew yeah. picking up spots on pit road? Let's check. We have a camera mounted at the line where they score the cars coming at pit exit. Tony Stewart. There's Matt Kenseth. And now watch this for third. Oof. Got to give it to Little E. Oh, barely. So Junior off third. Jeff Gordon off fourth. Caution for the third time in the Daytona 500. After trouble on the back straightaway. Here's our crew cam. This is Brian Chase, the jackman from Michael Waltrip's machine. It's a busy time. Tony Stewart leading Matt Kenseth second. The race for third. Earnhardt Jr. and Jeff Gordon there, 8-24. You mentioned that on that last caution, Sterling Marlin gave up fifth position. He came off pit road fifth, then went back in again for another pit stop, and it's dropped him back to 18th position. We'll try and get a follow-up report on what happens to the driver of the 40. Looks like today that high line is struggling, today. It's just not working at all. And Gordon finally squeezes down and gets to the inside and leaves Tony, his teammate, Jimmy Johnson, the 48 hung on the outside. Matt, what about the 24? Jeff Gordon's car was a little loose before that caution. He just could not run on that high side, and it was slowing him, him up. That's exactly what happened during this run. The car's still a little free. He needed to get to the bottom. That's where his car works the best. Unfortunately, he hung out his teammate, Jimmy Johnson, doing so. Boy, he sure did, Matt. Just looking at that pack there, Michael Waltrip really hasn't been at the front of the field most of the day. That's very surprising to me. Michael might be playing a waiting game because Slugger Lavey, Michael Waltrip, anyone you talk to with that car will tell you that they are fast. But you're right, he hasn't challenged for the lead, but that could be by design. Two lap cars there in the middle of these uh, lead cars trying to get through and keep up with the front four. Take a look at the AOL top speed as we come to complete lap number 69 and start lap 70. Who's fastest? 
24 car kind of tucked at the end of that lead draft. Jeff Gordon with the AOL top speed. And that's a, a speed of an average all the way around the racetrack, not the speed as they cross the line. Uh, Jimmy Johnson in that 48 car really wants to get by the 41 car piece here so he can get down in that bottom line and pick up the draft of those first four cars. It's kind of complicated here for some of the people like Michael Waltrip and Kevin Harvick. you got three cars not on the lead lap right there at the head of these double wide lines. you got Casey Mears in the 41. you got Ricky Rudd in the 21 and Ricky Craven in the 32. They have every right to be there. Yeah. But these lead lap cars try to keep up with those front four and they've got to deal with the traffic first. Wow, who is that that was pushing Ricky what? Rudd there? Is that Bush? That's Kurt Bush. Whew, he got a run. Got to run. 97 car. Kurt Bush really got to run. Okay, push the 21 car right on by. That 97 has shown to be fast. Yeah. Very fast. And what's at stake for him here? He's uh -oh, all trouble. trouble. Contact on Hang the man. Hang on, Hang on. Oh, Trip and now Brian Vickers. Oh. Robbie Gordon, 31. The top. Oh, Waltrip's over. Guys, 25 guys One, into it. two, three times for Michael Waltrip. Well, there's the now, big one the right big there. One. Took a lot. There's a lot of good cars right there. Is that Sterling Marlin in there? 40 cars in it. That's Michael Waltrip's car upside down. Terry Smith. See a uh, movement there at the left side of the car. As we look at it. Caution flag is out, the field has slowed, and the safety and rescue workers already there attending to Michael Waltrip's car and the others involved in this big crash down the back straightaway. And that is, this is why NASCAR slow these cars down on the caution flag to let the rescue workers get there to attend to these drivers they've as quickly as possible. They've got, they're so much faster right oh. now than they used to. Oh man, it's unbelievable. There's Brian Vickers out of his car. Jamie McMurray in the accident. Driver with the star in his uniform. Back left of the screen. He's out of his car. Pit road is open. Let's uh, check on the pit stops. Marty. Alan Matt Kenseth in second place. He said I need to little bit, be a little bit tighter if I'm going to run up front here. I about wrecked six times that time. Half around down the track bar, Dave. More good news for Tony Stewart's. No chassis changes this time. Four fresh tires. Plus the news that Michael's okay. Weber? This should be routine. Four tires for the eight car and fuel. Seem to take a long time on the right front, Matt. The 24 is in. It's going to be a four tire change for Jeff Gordon. His car has started to come to him. Jimmy Johnson also has been He's not going to be the 20 and the 8 off the road. I think Jeff Gordon got there first. Yeah. Good stop. See the rest of the teams exiting pit road after their stops. And the work around the Michael Waltrip car to extricate him from that machine after it turned over at least three times down the backstretch. When the car slid off into the grass, I saw one of the tires leave the machine, and when that rim that was left on it dug into the grass, it just sent the car kind of cartwheeling over on its roof. And, and when you're in a situation like that, you are just a passenger, especially when these cars start turning each other. Here you see, looks like Johnny Sauter slid up in the 30 car into Brian Vickers in the 25, a chain reaction. Yes, that's Michael Talkins. Yes. Yeah. And Biffle, the pole sitter, did he? Looks like he barely got through there. So you see the tire come off of Michael's car. Uh -oh. Then it got into that grass softened by the rain, and it just dug in, just like we saw Ryan Newman's last year and sent the car over. There's Harvick, yeah. Kevin LePage, Johnny, Johnny Benson, Benson, Terry Labonte, <laughs> saw McMurray and Vickers. Okay, here we go. This might be our best shot. Watch the car to bottom there. The blue 30. and yellow car. Slides up right there. Just ever so little contact, which doesn't look like a lot when you run 185, 190 miles per hour. It's a lot. There's the 15. And about right now, he's going to dig in. There goes one of the tires that Allen talked about. <sighs> violent. Very violent. Mm. Yeah, when you hit that grass, hang on. And the 30 car, he comes up and just, it's like you said, Wally, another six inches. Probably would have not been an accident. And it looks like the 30 to me got a little bit loose down there. He got a little bit loose. He corrected, but when he corrected, he slid up the racetrack. And there, unfortunately, there were two cars on the outside of him. Let's go on board Michael Waltrip. And That's us, guys. 
25 got into us. That's us. And that's inside Michael Waltrip's car. And Michael's Five. probably He's He's getting, getting, out. Out. getting out of the car now. Michael is crawling out of that thing. Good. But you can see every see everybody see how close everything yeah. is in there, very combined. Plus you got the roof on you. The dash is all crushed on you. The people in the back can see that and listen to the huge applause that Michael gets as he gets out and waves to the crowd. That's a good sign. Take the stretcher and put it back. We don't need it. So not the kind of day Michael Waltrip hoped for, certainly. In this Daytona 500, he was hoping to come away with his name inscribed on the Harley Earl Trophy for a third time as a 500 winner. Instead, he's going to be on every 11 o'clock sportscast tonight with the uh, spectacular flyer through the infield. That's, that's a roof cam. Watching all these guys pick the debris up. Trouble off turn two involves 12 cars and sends Michael Waltrip for a flying tumble. Caution flag is out in the 46 Daytona 500. Frightening, scary moment. Fortunately, Michael Waltrip out of his car and it's just fine. Welcome back, everybody. So there is a look at the number eight car that Dale Earnhardt Jr. ran in the 2004 Daytona 500. Remember, use the hashtag NASCAR throwback. We love hearing from you, and that hashtag is trending nationwide on Twitter right now. I have loved reading everything that has come in on the bottom of the screen, bringing DJ and Parker back into the show. Let's pull up a couple of tweets that stood out to us over the last couple minutes. This one from Jr. himself. He says, Kurt Busch was really unhappy with me for giving him that tire rub, but Greg Biff will have my rear tires off the ground there. What surprises me about this, DJ, is this race was, what, 13 years ago? And here's Junior recalling very specific details about how everything went down. Okay, I'm sure when he went to the grocery store the other day to get something that Amy told him to get, that he probably <laughs> forgot exactly what he was getting. But don't question the driver whenever you're talking about a race, and in particular, one that you won. You can pretty much know everything that went on. But, you know, this was a close call. A lot could have happened right there. Could have been the end of the day for Dale Jr. if Kirk Busch uh, gets into him a little bit more there, but everything turned out fine. Could have cut that left rear down. Yeah. That was really scary. Was that a shot across the bow? Are we going to get a tweet from Jr. next about what he picked up at the store for Amy today? <laughs> 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 no, I'm just saying that drivers' minds, they're just, they act in a totally oh, different way. Very narrow-minded. Oh, 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 Very that's narrow -minded. what you're saying. That's what you're saying. Okay, let's pull up another tweet and uh, see what we have. So this one from Hendrick Motorsports. In 2004, Chase Elliott was eight years old and racing go-karts. Hashtag NASCAR throwback. You know, Parker, when I'm watching this, it's just fun to remember that half of this field is no longer in the Cup Series. A lot of fans who have been tweeting in say that they have the entire race on VHS. They're getting very nostalgic like it was yesterday. But the fact of the matter is that there are a lot of young drivers in the sport now who were just coming up at the time of this particular race. Well, I was in the same similar position. That photo before, I was just in my first win. So I was just out of go-karts, or first win in cars. But, you know, that's what's so cool about the NASCAR throwback. I've seen so many tweets about the sound of the race cars, those old X-pipes you had in those race cars. I've seen people talking about BP, of course, and just commenting on these old race cars and kind of the old surface we used to have at this racetrack being a little bit bumpy. That is what's so fun about this. But also, be sure, if you're watching this, to join us on Facebook Live, NASCAR and NBC. We're doing those in the commercial breaks and during the race so you can watch it live with myself and DJ. We're reading all your tweets. Keep sending them in. We want to see everything, hear everything, and get your memories, of course. These are absolutely awesome to see. Yeah, absolutely. If you use the hashtag, we will find you. But let's get back to the race now. Tony Stewart still in the lead, looking for his first win in the Daytona 500. Second place. Dale Jr., Tony Stewart, side by side, instead of nose to tail like they've been all day. And here comes Greg Bickle. 16. Uh-oh, Earnhardt Jr. stuck in the middle of the eight car. Jimmy Johnson for the lead on his teammate, Jeff Gordon. And boy, they have completely split. Nobody's going to go up there and help, not at the moment. That's hard to go. Wide. Looking up my side. Uh -huh. For the race lead. Three abreast of two. And I'll tell you what, Dave Blaney ran so well last Saturday in the bus shootout. It 
continues today. Terrific run for that white 23 car. It's right there. And that's a team build that is, oh, that's squeezing it down there in front of the eight-car Dale Jr. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, I'll let you finish the thought of the 23 Yeah, I was holding my breath there, but uh, Allen just two minor air pressure adjustments on that car all day. Felipe Lopez calling the shots for Bill Davis Racing. It's been a great day. Saturday night, and you know, this is a team that this may be their last race. That's where I was going, BP. This team is not scheduled to show up at the race in Rockingham, North Carolina next Sunday. The sponsorship that's on the side of their car here is for this Speed Weeks only. They don't have backing for the rest of the season. Not planning on going next week. I talked with Pucci Philippe Lopez this morning. Griffin and Gordon side by side, and each one of these guys. I mean, they just want to get behind Jimmy Johnson and get in single file. How about this 16 car? BP? Greg Hipple told you when we talked to him via the radio on the pace laps, he thought he had a good enough car to get from the back to the front. That's just what he told Bill and I this morning. See Jimmy Johnson trying to give the 24 car, Jeff Ford, some help. Gets up to the high side, gives him some help drafting, but now he left the bottom open. And Greg Biffle is going to fill it. And Biffle, he said as long as he has somebody behind him pushing him good, he'd be okay. And he's got one of the best right now in the eight. Let's get more on Greg Biffle from pit lane. Hey, Alan, uh, Benny, Benny, remember how he found out that he was going to the back of the field? He was in the rain delay for the Bush race watching television, and a friend called him and said, hey, you're going to the back of the field. You're not, you're not going to start on the ball. He goes, that's impossible. He goes, that, so then he saw it on during the rain coverage that he was going to start at the back of the field. That's a heck of a way to find it out, Dave. When we started the show talking about how the damage 20 car was prepared, repaired to make this field, but we didn't talk about how the slow 20 car became the fast 20 car. I talked to Greg Zibidelli later in the week about the change, the transformation they had made on this 20 car. Greg said, I went back to our library of notes. I read everything we'd ever done at any restrictor plate track, Talladega and Daytona, every year. And I studied and we changed and we came up with a solution. Guys, you just don't pick up time at Daytona like the 20 car picked up this week. It's amazing the transformation that has taken place. Last Sunday in qualifying, I made the statement, unless they pick up the speed, they will not win the Daytona 500. But in that seven days of followed, they obviously found enough speed. They can win the Daytona 500. We heard from Michael Walter, Ben Bryan Vickers, Robbie Gordon, and Jamie McMurray involved in that last accident. Also treated and released from the Infield Medical Center. You heard from Sterling Marlin, and you saw Ryan Newman drive their cars into the garage and getting them worked on there. Halfway in the Daytona 500, our Napa Field summary. Dale Earnhardt Jr. has led the most laps today. Well, not in front now. Those who have led among the six drivers: Earnhardt Jr., Tony Stewart, Jimmy Johnson, Jeff Gordon, Kevin Harvick, and Kyle Petty led some laps under that last caution. Four yellow flags. The five retired from the race include Michael Waltrip's Napa machine, Ryan Vickers, Casey Kane, Jeff Burton, and Mark Martin. The latter three all with early engine trouble took them out of this Daytona 500. What a performance by Greg Biffle. What a performance by Tony Stewart's team. Remember? Oh, look at that. Sorry, dear. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Boy, that 48 car got a run, and now he's going to get hung out. I don't know. Oh, a little loose there with Biffle. Down on the bottom, his car got a little sideways on him. That's going to cost him a little bit. He told me that his car is bottoming out the front cross member. Oh, some Ooh. trouble there. <laughs> got in the left rear of the 48. He told me that his car is bottoming out down between one and two, the front cross member. That's probably what happened to him there, Ronnie. Well, I'll tell you what, he better not do that with somebody on his bumper or he's going to be sideways because... If, you're, if Dale Jr. was like that, when his car bottomed out, that car will turn sideways. Coming up on halfway in the Daytona 500. It's been a pretty exciting race so far. I feel safe in saying the best is yet to come. 68 laps to go in the 2004 running of the Daytona 500. Tony Stewart leading Dale Earnhardt Jr., Scott Wimmer, Kevin Harvick, and Greg Biffle. None of those drivers have ever won the Great American Race before. 
couple things to update you on. Some drivers who were involved in earlier crashes have come back onto the track. Rusty Wallace, Scott Riggs, Derek Cope, Ryan Newman, and Sterling Marlin are all back in action, as is Jeff Green. Marlin, though, just been shown the black flag by NASCAR for not meeting the minimum speed requirement with his repaired car. And when I saw his car come down Pitt Road, I realized he was not going to meet yeah. the minimum. All he was trying to do was just get a few more laps. What a day for Scott Wimmer running third, Matt. Scott Wimmer, a rookie, but driving like a veteran and thinking like a veteran. He's managing, he's managing his race. Talking to crew chief Frank Stoddard, they're expecting a pit around lap 140. Frank said, what changes do you want? Scott said, I'm afraid to really mess with it. Let's not change anything. But he knows he has one more stop after the one on lap 140, just in case he does need to make an adjustment. Meanwhile, Jeff Gordon and the 48 of Jimmy Johnson, they were both in the top five about 25 laps ago. They both were dropped out, drop kicked back. Gordon trying to work his way back to the front. Jimmy Johnson, he's working on a tight race car right now. You know, as Matt said, it's, it's one thing, too. When you come in, especially when you're a rookie, when you come in, you don't want to change too much on that race car because you don't want to lose the guys you came in with. You don't want to take any more extra time in the pits just in case something goes wrong. You lose that group. The second group headed by Greg Biffle, falling a little bit behind the front three. A couple of seconds now in the front four, I think, excuse me. 30 car of Johnny Sauter, one of the running wounded around here trying to just stay out there and make some laps for some next L cup points just just kind of doing up some numbers here and thinking about pit stops uh, we're, we're going to start to see some more green flag pit stops fairly soon for some of these drivers is Jeff Gordon puts a move on Greg Biffle for fifth place and Dave Blaney in the 23 tries to go with him I think Pitbull's just happened to get out of the gas up there. Yeah, he is. He's really been struggling that 16 car. Really I'm tight late. to 16 now, really tight. And something that might be contributing that to that is the wind. Yeah? We will talk about that, but the wind blowing pretty much directly down the backstretch into turn three. So when they make that left turn, it's kind of a tailwind knocking the back end of the car around the which, which just magnifies the problem if you're pushing. Spectrum leaders potentially this lap. All right, the, we've raced 136 laps. They can make a one more stop. You want to get these guys out of the way. You certainly don't want. Looks like the 50 was waving. So Tony Stewart, Dale Earnhardt Jr., the lap car of Kurt Busch, all hugging that inside line. They're coming to pit road. Scott Wimmer hard on the brakes. Ooh, oh, Johnny Sauter. Rifling right through the leaders and blowing the pit road entry big time. Greg Biffle also in. Close call for these leaders. Oh, man, was that close. Dave. And trust me, that's frightening from where I stand down here behind a hopefully protective wall. Four tires for Stewart, no changes, full of fuel. They didn't want to change anything. Certainly didn't want to make it any looser, Tony said. Weber? Dale Earnhardt Jr. said his car is the best it's been when he's in traffic, but they want to still try and get him out front. Major chassis adjustment, Matt. They were concerned about possible damage that right front fender. It was fine. A fourth tire change. He's not going to beat out the 20. They made a half a pound air pressure adjustment out of that right rear. Dale Earnhardt Jr., though, kind of separated there. See Stewart, then Kurt Busch, the lap car, then Wimmer, and then a gap. Back to Dale Jr. Here's Jeff Gordon on pit road, Dave Blaney, Kevin Harvick, Joe Nemechek now among the lead group. In the Army car. And now Johnny Sauter coming in to serve a penalty for that little blast through pit road a minute ago, Dave. Kevin Harvick brings a 29 in. They didn't get all the tape off the nose they wanted to last time. He was running hot, but not too hot. They'll take some more off this time. Four tire change, no chassis adjustments. Matt, on the previous lap, Jeff Gordon, Keith as Mike and said, the eight is pitting, the eight is pitting. What do we want to do? Robbie Loomis said, stay out for a few more laps. A four tire change. Again, Bill, no adjustments for Jeff Gordon. The 23 of Dave Blaney drag races the Zero one off of pit road. Cars just a little bit tight all around. Fuel four tires. He's off of pit road. John Andretti, Ward Burton, Brendan Gaughan, and Kyle Petty also pitting on this lap. Now here come Matt Kenseth, Jimmy Johnson, 
and Elliott Sadler all lead lap cars. Marty? Not a good sequence for the 17 team. He was supposed to pit with Jeff Gordon, Jeff tricked him, so Matt had to stay out on the track, killed all of his momentum. Then he overshot his stall to be pushed back. Four tires and a track bar adjustment for the 17, Dave. Elliott Sadler radioed in. The car's going aero tight. It feels like there's a shock broken or something. Big chassis adjustment for Elliott. Matt? Big chassis adjustments also for Jimmy Johnson up on the track bar. Also a legend adjustment. His car still very tight. You can see donuts down the side. Looks more like it's been run in Martinsville. Bobby Labonte, Dale Jarrett, Casey Mears, Ricky Rudd also leaving the pit lane. Having just come on for service with that group of cars. Look at the gap from Scott Rimmer back to Dale Jr. As a result of that pit exchange. And there goes Junior and Biffle by the 24 car of Jeff Gordon. Gordon is going to be able to hook onto these two. Now, these three cars might be able to chase down Jimmy Johnson and that group. I mean, I'm talking Tony Stewart and that group. So the lead is going to go back to Tony Stewart here as these pit stops cycle around. Kyle Petty has just come in to serve a penalty. Dave? Well, now I don't know what happened. He came in the pit stall, then he went right back out on Kyle Petty. His car has been good all day, guys. My notes all the way down the list. Re uh, reads no changes to the chassis all day long, and apparently there will be a penalty because he took that catch can with him. Yeah, he had pitted on the previous lap and apparently took some equipment out of the box, and that's a penalty. So Kyle has just come in and served it, and that's going to hurt. A stop and go is a huge penalty when you have to come in at 55 miles per hour, stop, and then take off again, and still stay 55 miles per hour. So through a round of green flag pit stops for the lead lap cars, it spread the front pack out a little bit, but as we saw last time this happened, the second group was able to draft up and catch the first and make it a... a about a 10 11 car race for the lead once again yeah i think a lot of the reason because of that the last time though is because biffle could not stay tight in line because he was trying to cool that car off but we'll see what happens with the second group it's got maybe some more cars in it bill part of the problem with greg biffle he had an equalized left front tire and didn't know it oh man Let's see, Junior the last time by was about three-tenths of a second faster than his three cars in front. So it looks like that Dale Earnhardt Jr., the 8, the 16 of Biffle, and the 24 of Gordon will be able to chase them down. Another penalty on that round of pit stops. Ward Burton held for a missing lug nut. Hmm. So uh, costly, costly error there. It's dropped him back to 19th place. Jeff Gordon in a bid for a third Daytona 500 win, a 97 and 99 winner of this race. Trying to push Greg Biffle and Dale Earnhardt Jr. back up to the lead few. Tony Stewart in search of his first Daytona 500 win. Another round of pit stops, and who knows what kind of a finish we'll see. Daytona's known for its late race twists. Back at Daytona International Speedway. Here come the leaders to pit road. Dale Earnhardt Jr. trying to pull a reverse on Tony Stewart and outbreak him to the pit lane. Greg Biffle, Jeff Gordon, Kurt Busch, Scott Wimmer in. These stops coming in the final laps of the Daytona 500. Dave? Tony Stewart's car is just a hair loose. He asked for just a little bit more air pressure in the right front to tighten up that car. Bill, Tony Urey Jr. told his crew on the radio it's showtime. It's four tires and fuel for the eight to come around to the left side. Bad. Jeff Gordon trying to win his third Daytona 500. They put a half a pound of air pressure back in it. They took out of the last stop. The 22 car is going to be the 24 off pit road, as does the 20 and the 8. Two tires on the 22 car, Matt. Get you to confirm that for us, but I'm pretty sure I saw Scott Wimmer leave with just two tires. Two tires on the 22 car. No adjustments. All right, so Frankie Stoddard, Scott Wimmer's crew chief, going to roll the dice on the tire strategy. But he has no one to work with him. He's by himself. And when these guys get to MVP, they're going to say bye-bye. Just blow by him. Here comes the second group of cars then. Jimmy Johnson, Kevin Harvick, Joe Nemechek. All from that second lead pack down the pit lane. Marty? Joe Nemechek's had a great run in a car that's very good. Pitting with Kevin Harvick. It'll be a 2-2. 
four tire stop for the 01, Dave. Four tire stop for Kevin Harvick. No chassis changes. Car is not running hot. They need to get the left side on quick, Matt. And the 48 is in. Remember that slow pit stop cost them last time. He is now down and away. He will be going out with the 29 and the 01. And Greg Biffle's chance to win the Daytona 500 is gone. He's on pit road to serve a penalty for speeding, coming in for his pit stop last time by. Unless the caution comes out and allows him to catch up to the pack. Sorry, Greg. Yep. Have to wait till next year. And we saw when he made his entry on the pit yep. road, all the ground that he made up, you knew that he was too fast, and the NASCAR officials did not let it pass. So Scott Wimmer's team takes just two tires. He's well clear of these two, Tony Stewart and Dale Earnhardt Jr. <laughs> but when they get to him, they're going to be going fast. Wimmer now the leader with 29 laps to go. Here's Frankie Stoddard watches him go by. Here's the cars coming on the pit road just a moment ago. There we see Junior tries his best to get in front of Tony Stewart. Can't quite make it. Look at Biffle up there. He just passes all these cars as he entered pit road. Look at the ground he made up. And that's obviously speeding. Yeah. The wheels locked up. No kidding. Yep. So the pass-through penalty for Greg Biffle has dropped him down to 14th place, 27 seconds behind leader Scott Wimmer. Now, these two drivers, Tony Stewart and Dale Earnhardt Jr., are second and third, 2.6 seconds behind Scott Wimmer. Problem for Wimmer is he's out there all by himself. There he goes, and here come these yeah. two cars with the lap car of Kurt Busch all tucked up in the draft. Guys are about a half a second to three quarters of a second a lap faster than Scott Wimmer, who's sitting out there by himself. So he's really a sitting duck. And Frankie Starter, the crew chief on this 22, that's exactly that shot we saw. He was saying, Man, why did I do that? I'm a sitting duck. Why don't I change two <laughs> tires and get with these guys? showed you earlier our uh, Home Depot virtual garage how the cars tuck tightly together in the draft here at Daytona basically break the air more efficiently than the one car running by itself and are faster and there's the gap from Wimmer to Tony Stewart and you can watch the interval shrink in our real-time telemetry and that thing Scott's gonna have to worry about is that car's handling is not gonna be as good with two tires on it so he's gonna have to use a lot more racetrack than the three cars that are behind him right now if Scott Wimmer the 22 had just another car do the same strategy and get hooked up together it's great strategy but exactly. by yourself no good Dave and BP that's what happened to Jeremy Mayfield on Thursday's 125 mile qualifier they had made deals with other guys to take only two tires but then everyone bagged him and as we saw on Thursday everyone closed in on Jeremy and then it, they passed him they blew right by him same thing potentially for Scott Wimmer here another guy that's out there all by himself is Jeff Gordon Scott Wimmer, now down to just eight tenths of a second is lead, Matt. We've talked a lot about gambling. Frank Stoddard, two tires. Very gutsy call. Well, I mean, it was a pretty easy call. You know, we were uh, we were at the back of that line right there. Uh, you know, we're, we're just here to get a top ten finish. I'd like to win the Daytona 500. I wasn't going to win the Daytona 500. The, the team wasn't going to win it. Caterpillar wasn't going to win it by uh, putting on four because, you know, even if we had a great pit stop, chances are that we weren't going to beat both of them out. Uh, that was our chance to try to win it. They got a heck of a draft on us. We're probably going to be in a little bit of trouble, but it's been a heck of a show on all day. Scott's done a great job. The team's done a great job. And, uh, you know, heck, what, you never know. Maybe we'll hold them off. Okay, go on back up. BP, we talked about it earlier. Three cars is faster than one. Oh, yeah. And Scott Wimmer was by himself. These three cars hooked up. And now, can he stay in front? Frank said, maybe we can stay in front of him. He's he has shown some speed, but with two tires, I doubt it. I don't think so either, Benny. Maybe he'll stay a little while, but... He was bobbing and weaving for all yeah. he could, trying to put the block on Tony Stewart. Eventually, he'll be sliding up the racetrack. He'll leave that bottom open, and those guys will drive underneath him. Maybe right now. Right now? Okay. Wimmer up the hill off turn number two. Here comes Tony Stewart for the lead. Wimmer to block. But I don't think it's going to work. Looks just like Wally World, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't we do this once before? So Tony Stewart reclaims the lead in the Daytona 500. 
I'll tell you what, the key to this whole deal right now is that 97 car. Who, who, he, goes who he goes with. Bill, what are they saying about the eight? I think the eight needs some help, doesn't he? Uh, he's in pretty good shape right now. He just wants the laps counted down. Wally, you know after the twins on Thursday, Tony Urey Sr. was very disappointed that Michael Waltrip didn't work with him and made a comment to that effect after the race. Well, Dale Earnhardt Jr. went to the media center and was immediately asked about the comment. Only he thought Tony Urey Jr. made it. So he stormed out of the media center, went back to the garage, and got in a confrontation with Tony Urey Jr. What do you say? What are you saying? Well, Dad just stood in the corner and watched and laughed. You Jr. was apologizing for something he didn't even do until Dad walked in and said, it was me that made the comment. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> you know who the most popular spotter up there is right now? Kurt Busch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Our Budweiser aerial coverage of this Daytona 500. Looking down on the drivers who will decide the win among them. Tony Stewart, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Scott Wimmer hanging on to the lead draft. But the man in the third running car in line, Kurt Busch, who is one lap down, been with these leaders for a long time now. And the spot that you're, that you're talking about is Jeremy Brickhouse, the nephew of Richard Brickhouse, who won the first race wow. at Talladega. Wow. Will he be able to push Dale Jr. by Tony Stewart for the win? Well, <laughs> will he be able to, and will he? That's right. I tell you, the spars will all have a little meeting. One will have a Home Depot jacket on. <laughs> One will have a Budweiser jacket, and then there'll be the Sharpie jacket, and they'll all be in huddle. Spotters, of course, position high atop the grandstand, atop the towers here at Daytona to look and help their driver around the racetrack. Spot trouble ahead. Communicate back and forth with the driver. We are looking at Kurt Busch's spotter. <laughs> Let's make a deal in progress. That's Dale Jr.'s spotter there, Stevie Reeves. It's talking with Brickhouse. So they're all ready to get <laughs> yeah, <spotter>. yeah. <laughs> It wasn't going to take long. Hey, guys, I'm with Jimmy Fenning down here on the pit box. You appear to be the key to this whole thing. Uh, any great deals yet? Do you know who you're going to go with? Well, the eight car wanted to come and uh, ask for some help, but uh, we also got to remember he's the one who caused us two laps down. So I know it's Kurt's job out there. He's driving that car. We're not. Uh, drivers and teams never forget, do they? Weber? Jimmy Fennick said you just paid him a visit. Well, what were you talking about with Jimmy Fennick, Tony? Oh, we just got a few jokes. A few jokes? Did you ask for a little help? Uh, I just went down and had a conversation with him, see, uh, see how they felt about the end of this race. So uh, we'll see what happens at the end. Okay. He's smiling now, but he wasn't when he came back from the 90s. I did not, Bill. <laughs> Well, we're down to it. The final 50 miles of the Daytona 500. Now you up to the maid. No fuel necessary to make the finish. You know, one thing you were talking about earlier about, well, it, you know, it's popular to push Junior across, but I'll tell you what, you still got to face your crew guys. And if you're in the 97 and go, man, that's a guy that put us two laps down. That hurts in a tough position right now. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks to you guys. The NASCAR throwback hashtag still trending nationwide, so keep sending them in. And as we head for the finish in the 2004 Daytona 500, let's take a quick look at a couple more tweets that have come in since I saw you last. So Brendan Gaughan was on the track that day. He just tweeted, I remember my spotter telling me how close I was to getting wrecked in the big one. Never saw how close until just now. Here's another look at it. So Gaughan was in the light orange 77 here just narrowly avoided being part of that 12 car wreck. Gone would finish 19th in the race. He now runs full time in the Xfinity series, of course, but glad that he's with us. And the fans also sending in some real gems. I love this one. Wow! Exclamation mark. The 2004 Daytona 500 VCR issues that day. So don't tell me how it ends. Hashtag NASCAR throwback at NASCAR and at NASCAR on NBC. All right, we're not going to give it away because that would just be rude, but we are going to take a quick break and then we'll bring you back to the race. First, though, another behind the scenes look from the social media war room as we call it all of our people working very hard getting entirely too close to their computer screens sending in your tweets jumping on instagram use the hashtag nascar throwback so you can get them on the show everybody in that room monitoring them closely we'll be back
We're seeing the top three plus the lap car of Kurt Busch. Now look at the gap back to Jeff Gordon and the amount of time he lost in that last exchange. As a matter of fact, Jeff Gordon has fallen back all the way to this next group of Kevin Harvick and Jimmy Johnson. Matt? About 10 laps ago, Benny, Jeff Gordon came on the radio and says, I have to know who is coming, who is leading that pack so I can be ready to block because that big pack will blow by me in a second, but I'm not careful. He was hoping Skinner would jump in front and act kind of like a blocker to help push him. Kevin Harvick and his teammate Jimmy Johnson are in that pack, so they're going to try to hook up. See who so 97 Stewart goes. Not wanting to give it up. 97. Who's he going with? He's gonna go with Stewart. 22, and he's going with Stewart. I had to think he would. <laughs> <laughs> Junior could not quite make it. He's still trying. Here oh, he goes look again. At this. Another run to the inside of Stewart, and he might have him this time. A great round going to turn clear. three. He's got it. Good job. You're clear. <laughs> New leader of the 500 is Dale Earnhardt Jr. Wow. And the fans are going nuts in Daytona. You know, someone told me a couple of days ago, if this kid in the eight car wins a Daytona 500, we might not be safe in this tower, Wally. These fans will go ballistic. They will rock the stands, huh? They will rock the stands in Daytona. Okay, so now who spotter is trying to make a deal with Kurt Busch's? <laughs> now we know pretty much what's going to happen. Dave? They told Tony Stewart right before that Kurt swears he's going to go with you. Now that was one opportunity, but I see at least another opportunity, guys, coming up where Kurt still has a chance to help the 20 a lot. Yes, you are right, Dave. Well, he tried, but it just, Junior was just enough to get around him. And a change for fourth place, Kevin Harvick, Jimmy Johnson. And now Joe Nemechek trying to draft by Jeff Gordon. Nemechek's going to get by. Is that Elliot Sattler behind Nemechek as well? And up front, Dale Earnhardt Jr. with a little gap between himself and Tony Stewart. Earnhardt Jr. in his fifth Daytona 500. He's had a good deal of success at this track's sister speedway in Talladega, Alabama, winning four of the last five races there. But he's had troubles in this race. 13th second, then 29th and 36th, his last two 500 finishes. Junior's car, if it was still a little bit loose, he's loving it now because as he as you run and put more laps on these tires, the car starts to tighten up and may get it just perfect near the end. Junior's got to be looking in the mirror a lot right now. Got to antis anticipate whatever move he thinks 20's going to make because the 20 is going to make a move, and he pretty much knows the 97 is going to go with him now. That die has been cast. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It'd just be inter interesting to see how long Tony, Tony waits because I don't think he can wait to the last two or three laps. Oh, I don't think so either. I, you know, you have to do agree. it. Yeah. If, he, if he's not under him coming to the white flag, it's going to be awfully hard to finish a pass right in a lap. As, as evenly matched as these two cars have been all day. And we watched Happy Hour yesterday, and we watched Dale Earnhardt Jr. in this A-car practice lap after lap, and we said he must not be happy. I talked to Tony Urey Sr. this morning, and why did you practice so much? Because the driver was not happy with the car. They finally put the car back chassis-wise like they raced it last year in the Daytona 500. And Junior said earlier in the show that every time you go out, it's different anyway. So I think they were trying to get as much information as they could to make the right adjustments. Tony Stewart has led nearly half of this Daytona 500, 97 down, laps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just told the next two cars in front of you to get us to the bottom. That's what I was doing, sorry. See, and Stevie Reeves told us that he's not accustomed, told Bill and I, he's just not accustomed to someone like Junior on the radio. Junior he wants to hear more. And he's that? so aggressive, you're right. He wants help all the time. Yeah. 14 laps to go. So Stevie didn't say anything down the back stretch, and Junior said, Come on, Spotter, tell me something. Yeah. 
And let me say, this is the first race that Stevie Reeves has spotted for the eight car. Last year, the job was done by Tom looking, Norris. Looking, looking, looking. And you see the 97 is going to go. But Tony Stewart has got to be closer to the eight car for him to make that move. Well, don't you think, too, the 97 has got to be closer to the 20 for him to help Tony? Yeah, but if all three of these guys, all three of these guys have to get in a different spot than the eight is. But the eight is so far in front, he can just weave. So if the 20 gets a fender on the eight car and the other three, two cars line up, they will get, you know, they should get by the eight car, but right now they can't get close enough to Dale Jr. You know, we criticized Frankie Stoddard for changing two tires, but if he can hang on for another 13 laps, that right was the right move because Scott Wimmer has a solid third place finish yeah. in the Daytona 500. Yeah, he's eight seconds ahead of fourth place Kevin Harvick. Whoa, another bob and weave by Stewart. See, like I said, Tony's not close enough. He's got to get a little bit closer to Dale Jr. to do that. So what's he trying to do with all, with all that move? Just get Earnhardt Jr. to react and maybe unsettle his car with a, uh, with a quick correction? Not so much to react and unsettle the car, but to try to break the draft is all they're trying to do. And if he can move up and the 97 move up with him and Earnhardt move down, he'll gain that little bit on the race track. Dave. And as they look again to the outside, we believe the 97 can help the 20, right? Yeah. Well, Kurt's got this problem. The 22 wants him out of there because he knows he's a lap down. They just radioed that to Kurt, Matt. That's exactly right, Dave. In fact, Frank Stoddard just told Wimmer, he said the 97 is telling us they're going to pull out of the way with three laps to go. We're hoping that maybe he'll pull out sooner so we can get you up closer. What a great run that Tony got off turn two as Junior passed that lap car, but it wasn't quite enough. Go ahead, Bill. Why does Dale Earnhardt Jr. like restrictor plate racing when a lot of drivers say it's not their favorite type of racing? Because it makes you think, and he's thinking pretty hard right now. Well, the thing is, if, if the 97 car, Kurt Busch, pulls out and Wimmer passes him, those two front cars are going to be far enough ahead where I don't think Wimmer can even make an attack. And to go next time, and all three up in front of you, I'm told. Stewart is going to need help. The Dale Earnhardt Incorporated team so dominant at Daytona and Talladega where the restricted engine package is used. You saw the graphic. Michael Waltrip, winner of this Daytona 500 two of the last three years. But Dale Earnhardt Jr. has yet to win the sport's biggest race. It took his father 20 years to win it. Despite being this track's most victorious driver, Dale Earnhardt claimed 34 Daytona victories in his career. But Junior's car looks good, though. It looks very strong. They can't get to the rear bumper. So we're going to have to come up on some slower cars here. Well, that was what you just heard Earnhardt Jr. and his spotter Stevie Reeves talking about. Stevie has his job is to go talk to the spotters of those cars, make sure they know the leader's coming up behind them, and which lane the leader would prefer to have. They don't have to give it to him, but obviously they are giving Jr. the bottom now like he wanted to have. Dave? Kurt Busch radioed in. One more try for you, Tony. That's all I've got for you. Matt? Scott Wimmer was starting to fade a little bit from the 97. He asked Frank Stoddard, tell Bush not to pull out yet. I need to kind of gain back up a little bit of the ground that I lost. They're also thinking about the bigger picture. Momentum coming out of Daytona. to go and now those other two drivers Kurt Busch and Scott Wimmer fading off Tony Stewart's back bumper that's not good news for no. fans of the orange car because unless the handling bobbles on that eight car one car by itself the 20 is just not going to be able to pull around and pass him here at Daytona I don't think so not Dale Nart Jr. Bill yeah, you guys are just talking about the past history here at this track. Tony, look on the outside. Junior wants the inside. It was 56 years ago today on Daytona's famous beach course that NASCAR ran its first sanctioned race. Also on February 15th, David Pearson won the 500. That was in 76. The King won it on February 15th in 81. And Bill Elliott won from the pole in 1987. But, Alan, as you were talking about, many fans will tell you the greatest moment in NASCAR racing came more recently than that. When the late Dale Earnhardt Sr. won his first and only Daytona 500 six years ago today, February 15th, 1998. And uh, if you had the privilege of being here at Daytona that day, 
you'll never forget it. You saw what winning the Daytona 500 meant and the emotion that Dale Earnhardt showed in victory lane. It was like many had never seen him before. I think Stewart laid back. He laid back to get Kurt Busch to try to get a push by Junior. He knew he couldn't do it by himself. He tried to find someone to help him. And that's the smartest thing he could do. Exactly. If he just lays back and lets Kurt know he's going to lay back, he'll, have to, he'll get a heck of a run. A lot of drivers call this drafting thing a high-speed game of chess. Strategy, moves, knowing which moves to make and when. And that's why Earnhardt Jr. keep asking Stevie for that information, because if he sees the 20 laying back, he needs to lay back a little bit. And his dad, Dale Earnhardt, was the greatest of that. He saw a car backing up, he would back up to them, so they couldn't get that run. Jr. might be doing the same thing. Tony Stewart, so optimistic all week long. After some early speed week troubles, they got that 20 car tandling dialed in on Thursday when they ran the qualifying races here that set the starting order for the 500. And since then, he's been very bubbly, got into the final practice crash yesterday, turned his week on a downside, but right from the start of this race, that 20 car has been fast, it got up in the early laps, drafted with Dale Earnhardt Jr. to the front, and these two drivers have dominated most of this Ooh. race. And Bush lit up the race track there. Got to run. You're all clear. Bob and Weave. See, that was a spotter on the back stretch that gave him that signal. Because Stevie Reeves from the front stretch really can't see that well coming off turn two. Five to go when they come to the start finish line. That's frustrating for the guys behind Junior and Junior's he's so antsy right now he wants this thing to be over. The 97th trying to drop back so watch for him hanging back. And Tony's like come on he's waving let's go come on come on let's go we need some help. What's he saying Dave? Well I, I can't confirm that strategy that you'd mentioned about falling back but I can confirm that Tony on his own was doing everything that he could. He reached out and he said guys that is all I've got I'm giving all I can. That was when he was running alone. It's got to be frustrating for Stewart to track that eight car lap after lap, hoping it bobbles, hoping it bobbles, and so far, yeah. he just can't see it. Junior's not going to bobble. I mean, he just needs he, what he has to have is help, and he doesn't have those guys close enough to do it. And Junior, on the other hand, he's going, yeah, get that 97 out of that pack. He wants to see that car as far back from the 20 as possible, Tony Stewart, because he knows that 97 of Kirk Bush is not on the tail of Tony Stewart. Tony can't do anything with him. The teams have done all they can for their driver now, barring a caution flag, and even if a caution flag, these guys aren't coming to pit road. It's all up to the man behind the wheel. There are the Uries. Tony Uri Sr. on the left, Tony Uri Jr. on the right. Tony Uri Sr. working with Dale Earnhardt for so many years. And there's Joe Gibbs watching his driver, Tony Stewart, try to earn the Joe Gibbs Racing Organization a second Daytona 500 trophy. When Dale Earnhardt's Dale children back a little bit. wanted to go racing, that was Dale Jr., Kerry, and Kelly, the daughter. He turned them over to Tony Uri Sr. I said, okay, here you go. Here's my kids. Take them racing. See which one has some talent. And obviously, he has proven, Dale Jr. has proven to have some great talent. First push, Scott Wimmer in the lap car of Kyle Petty. And that's not to say that Kerry doesn't have talent as well. Junior has certainly demonstrated himself to be a top-notch driver. Yes, he has. And he's trying to win NASCAR Racing's biggest prize, the Daytona 500. He'll be five miles away when he comes to the start-finish line this time. Afternoon sun beginning to cast long shadows over the Daytona International Speedway. And now just two laps remaining in this race. Stewart just can't get to him. Kurt Busch dropped back about three or four car lengths there. No help to the 20 car of Tony Stewart. But remember, we think back to what happened to Bill Elliott at Homestead. Last yeah, I heard senior here. And, and his father in 1990 with on the last lap right about, about right there. here. Yeah. Yeah. Got a tire? Or? You're perfect. Not a problem at all. We've been stopping short for him all day. And lost the race. He asked me about fuel. And Tony Uri said, you're perfect. We've been stopping early because Tony Stewart had a problem with fuel. 
Fans come to their feet as Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Tony Stewart take the one flag. We're in the final lap of the Daytona 500. Junior took the lead from Tony Stewart with 19 laps to go after he trailed Stewart's orange Chevrolet for much of the central part of the race. Now he's got to hang on for three quarters of a lap to earn a victory in the sport's biggest event. Stewart not close enough to make a move yet. It's all going to come down to whether Earnhardt has a bobble or a problem in his final third of the lap. Yeah, you can't get emotional yet because you've got to get off turn four and back to the start-finish line. And you can see it now. The legacy continues. Dale Earnhardt Jr. wins the 46th Daytona 500. Got it. Great run for Wimmer, too. Fantastic. Tony Stewart second. Scott Wimmer third. Kevin Harvick fourth. And Jimmy Johnson fifth. For Dale Earnhardt Jr., his first victory in the 500 in his fifth try. Well, there are some happy, happy, happy people. But none are happier than him. Oh, that's absolutely. right. You can't overstate the months of preparation that go into running this one race. These teams take these cars to the wind tunnel, various engineering rigs like chassis dynamometers and seven post rigs to test them, get them all dialed together for this one shot at getting their names inscribed on the Harley Earl Trophy. And it's Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s who will be inscribed as the 2004 winner. Matt? A hug from Danny Earnhardt. Tony Yuri Sr., it's the Daytona 500. This track is so meaningful for you and the Earnhardts. What does this mean to win it, finally? Phew. I know what uh, Big E went through all them years trying to win this race. Hey. We just won the Super Bowl this, this NASCAR race, and uh, you don't believe how hard we worked to get here. We got to thank John Andretti, Slugger, Michael Walter. Uh, Everybody. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Tony, he is like your other son. This has to be special for you to help him win this dream. Yeah. These two kids I got here, Dale Jr. and Tony Jr., uh, they both worked their guts out for this race team. We worked uh, 14 hours a day, seven days a week for the last month and a half to get here. Trying to build a car better than this car. We didn't think this car was going to be good enough to win this year. We just couldn't do it, so we rubbed on this one the week before we came. Worked the body shot to death and the fab shot to death and Wayne, Mickey, and AJ and Bruce and everybody else there. And uh, they did it, man. You guys back home, we did it. All right, Junior stopped right there and he calls these fans. He's got something up his sleeve, I think. Just get out and acknowledge these fans. They love you. Here he comes. Here he comes. <laughs> get out of the way, photographers. Let me in there. You want to know what winning this race means to someone? Have a look. said if I win this race tonight I don't know when the party's gonna stop well it sure started now now there's a hug yeah Tony Urie jr. the honor jr. their dads grew up together they grew up together it's a hug from his uncle Danny Earnhardt yeah, yeah, valid point just made to me there. He he is leading the NASCAR Bush Series race that's going to run here tomorrow. I guess you better be careful how long that party goes on, huh? <laughs> J.R. Rhodes there in a white shirt. Who... And the NASCAR official saying, okay, let's get this car to victory lane, please. We got a 
got a trophy to give you. Dale Earnhardt Jr., the third, now completing the third father and son combination to win a 500. Lee Petty and Richard Petty did it. Bobby Allison and Davey Allison did it. Now Dale Earnhardt and Dale Earnhardt Jr. 29th driver to win the 500. get that thing stuck in the grass. It's wet from all the rain we had here last night. I think there's enough people down there to push it out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm in victory lane, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. will once again climb out of his victorious Budweiser Chevrolet. In the same victory lane where six years ago today, his father celebrated a win in the Great American Race, the only time his dad won that race. It took his father 20 tries. Junior is here as a kid. There's Tony Uri Sr., a big hug for his other son. Now the family's here. Teresa Earnhardt. So, how long's the party gonna last? Man, I don't know. <laughs> you got a race tomorrow, you know. Yeah, I don't, it's going to be hard to do that, huh? <laughs> Good God. I'm Daytona 500 champion. I can't believe it. Forever, Dale. Forever. Yeah. I'm just amazed, man. It's just awesome. That uh, I couldn't believe I passed him by myself. What's Tell me about it. What's going on here? Tell me about it. Because you, you were thinking about it for a while. Oh, I was trying for a damn while, but I didn't know uh, it's going on forever. It's like a magic trick. Um, I tried, tried to figure out how to pass him, and I got a run on him, and uh, made it happen somehow. I don't know. Yeah. You don't know what you're doing at that point. You're just trying your heart out, and uh, I had a, I had a, I had a great car, awesome car built by Tony Senior and all the guys. I want to say to my sister, and my mama back home, all my friends. Uh, good God. I can't believe it. It's the greatest ever. We talked during testing. You said you thought it's harder to win the Daytona 500 <laughs> than to win the next Hell Cup champion. Yeah, I ain't got to worry about that no more. <laughs> sure go. Man, I tell you, it's a hard race to win. You know, it's a season in itself. That entire race is just there's so many things going on, so much running through your mind. You know, I've seen it. Been lost so many times by Dad over and over, and I, I was taught so many lessons by this place where I ever got behind the wheel, and... God, I'm glad I ain't got to worry about it no more. Man, this is awesome. You're only the third father-son combination to win the Daytona 500. Dale, your father won it six years ago today. Yeah, I mean, he he was over in the pasture side riding with me. I'm sure he was having a blast. Uh, believe it or not, I'm real surprised. The Goodyear tire did good all day. I didn't expect our car to handle him so well, but uh, the car drove awesome all day. It's real, real loose there at the end, but... Uh, you know, has had to be that way to be able to run good on old tires. And uh, Tony had a great car. We kind of been such good friends, you know, and, and uh, we helped each other all day. And and uh, by the way, uh, thinking of my other teammate, Michael Watcher, I'm glad he's all right. That was a scary looking accident, but I got a full week ahead of me. It's going to be exciting. Yeah, you're going to be a little busy for the next few days. <laughs> hey, you're leading the championship standings, yeah, too. Right, for the first time in my life. This is awesome. <laughs> Congratulations, Thanks Dale. Dale. Hart Jr. is the Daytona 500 champion of 2004. 13 years later and the 14-time most popular driver in NASCAR with his first Daytona 500 win from back in 2004. We so appreciate Dale Earnhardt Jr. coming along for the ride with us and everything that the fans submitted as well. DJ and Parker, this is now the top trending thing on Twitter in the entire <laughs> United States. So let's look at a few final tweets from Jr. as we wrap things up here. Here was one from a little earlier, DJ. I kept falling back, creating runs that I thought weren't going to amount to much with Tony Stewart easily defending them then one worked and that one DJ of course with 19 laps to go 
Yeah, and that's what he, that's what he and his dad were so good at. They knew exactly how far back to get that they could make that run at you. All you were looking for was maybe that driver in front, in this case, Tony Stewart, just to have to lift a little bit, was his car a little bit tight, just didn't get the run, have to turn the steering wheel a little bit too much, and it slowed it down. And he got that run. That's all that he needed. But then he had no help and made a great pass there. He had a strong car, but did a great job as the driver. He used that side draft, and that side yep. draft is so key these days, but it was key back then. And who's the best at it these days? Who's the template for side drafting? Dale Jr. Yeah, that's something that you say all the time on NASCAR America. Let's look at another one uh, from Junior. I got a phone call from the president after this race in the press box. I ended the call. He ended the call with, okay, take it easy, bud. <laughs> Hashtag NASCAR throwback. <laughs> and I loved that shot that a fan sent in, Parker, of Air Force One taking off right in the backdrop. There it is of, of Daytona. How special is that? That's absolutely awesome. And these, these moments right here are the moments that make you a race fan, but they're the moments that make you a NASCAR fan. And seeing Dale Jr. win this race with the present there, that taking off shot with Dale Jr. in it, that's an incredible shot. And that's just what the mystique of this Daytona is. All right, let's finalize yes, the poll. Yes, those things that don't, yeah, they last forever. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, let's finalize the poll that was running up on our NASCAR and NBC Facebook page. So you'll recall that the question, the greatest moments of Dale Jr.'s career, and uh, in a landslide here, 75. 5.6% the 2001 uh, Daytona 400, which makes sense, DJ. Yeah, no doubt about that. It changed his life and it changed this sport a lot uh, at that time when it needed something really good to happen. I have to agree with that one. I agree with all those fans out there. That was an incredible moment. And once again, just one of those incredible NASCAR moments. Yeah, well, we had so much fun. I know the fans did too. They were tweeting all night. It was a great experience. Hopefully we can bring you another one soon. But for now, that's it for this throwback. Huge thanks to all the drivers and the teams and especially the fans who interacted with us. Don't forget, full day of live NASCAR action tomorrow from Daytona, Xfinity and Cup qualifying starting at 2 p.m. Eastern, the Xfinity race is 7.30 Eastern, and the main event on Sunday, you can find it all with us. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again real soon.